Good mid-morning. We can't say afternoon. We can't quite say top of the morning. Uh, I hope everyone is nice and capping it up. Ian, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, thrilled uh, to welcome everyone to our powerhouse fireside chat conversation engagement with all of you on intelligence sharing beyond five eyes in a time of AUKUS. Uh, just as a little scene setter, I think it's important to note that the main theme uh, of our conversation hovers around the same topics that you've covered both yesterday and earlier today, which is as the strategic environment deteriorates further, our need for collaboration with trusted allies and partners expands more broadly. Uh, this idea has only accelerated after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we can see coalitional efforts to not only increase the intel collaboration to form a common operating picture, but also to tee up joint policy initiatives in some creative and interesting ways that we've not seen before. Now, as we shift our gaze uh, from Europe out to the Indo-Pacific, AUKUS is another such initiative that will allow us to broadly pool knowledge, manpower, and information to form a broader strategic picture, collaborate where we can, and move out in certain areas. But simply by saying AUKUS, we say a limited partnership, uh, because no matter how you split that acronym, that's only three countries. And so one of the questions that's arisen, one of the discussions which has taken off here in Washington, but also in London and in Canberra and in Tokyo and in Seoul and Wellington and elsewhere is how do we think about that balance uh, between wanting to broaden the coalition of partners who can collaborate, uh, share thoughts, share intelligence, share efforts and manpower, while also making sure that we move forward at an accelerated pace. And there is a tension and there is a balance there. And we have a fantastic panel uh, teed up to begin discussing this amongst ourselves first and then out with all of you. And I say amongst and then out because I think the theme we were just talking about backstage is that this is a conversation that starts among AUKUS and then extends outward. So I'm thrilled to introduce uh, our two very distinguished uh, panelists here. Uh, first, uh, on my left, on your right, I have Ann Rondo. Ann is the president of the Naval Postgraduate School, a former United States Navy Vice Admiral. Uh, she, has a, she has had a distinguished career uh, operating in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. Uh, she was Deputy Commander of U.S. Transportation Command and Commander of the Naval Service Training Command in addition to working on strategy development and policy advisory, role, advisory roles in the Department of Defense. She served as a White House Fellow at the Department of Justice. She's worked in the private sector. That was all before being appointed by the Secretary of Navy to her current role. But I should note that even in her current role as president of a JPME institution, uh, this is something she has lots of experience with as well because she previously was president of NDU and for a time served as a president of the College of DuPage in Illinois. Uh, next to her, we have Sir Simon Gass, who has had a long career as a British diplomat and a national security expert. Uh, while in the foreign office, uh, Sir Simon, who told me not to call him Sir Simon, but I can't help but calling him Sir Simon, uh, held appointments as ambassador to Greece as ambassador to Iran and as NATO's uh, senior civil representative to Afghanistan. Uh, he was the foreign office's policy or political director and he led efforts across the Middle East, Russia, Africa, South and Central Asia and the United Nations and other international institutions. Uh, a concise way of saying that is the entire world. Uh, after leaving the foreign office, uh, Simon became commandant to the Royal College of Defense Studies in 2018. He was appointed chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee and advisor on intelligence to successive British prime ministers. Uh, during that period, he was responsible for providing the prime minister and the National Security Council with intelligence-led analysis and assessments on the full range of issues affecting the UK's national security policies. As you can see, we have a wealth of experience 
uh, in the diplomatic world, in the intelligence world, in the defense world, in the educational world, and in the national security world. So I'm really thrilled uh, to turn it over to our experts. Um, and I would love to open with you to get your thoughts on how this partnership shapes up. Thanks, uh, Charlie. First of all, thanks to all of you. In listening to the discussion this morning on earlier, this notion about having a narrative wherein we are having these stories as teams and as, and as uh, partners is really important. So I want to thank New uh, America. I want to thank uh, the Arizona State uh, team and all of you for being here, dedicating your time, but also for the dialogue that you are making happen. So I really want to uh, thank you all very, very much. So why am I here? Uh, as a president of uh, Naval Post Graduate School. We, we began our life in 1909 after the Navy had made uh, trips to the Far East. And Teddy Roosevelt at the time had, had talked to the admirals who came back and the officers who came back and said, we need to have more work done in engineering and in the engineering sciences specifically. So that's when the birth of NPS happened in Newport, Rhode Island. After World War II, Admiral Nimitz came along and said, I need to have some education and some engineering focus on the West Coast pointing to Asia. We remember that he was a fleet commander in the Asian uh, world of World War II. So that began our birth in Monterey in California. Good weather, oh, by the way, so when it's really bad here, come out and see us. Uh, because it's never bad in Monterey. Uh, but we have a, this school out there. It's joint. It is not a JPME. It's a PME, a, a military education entity. So I can bring in NCOs who are qualified. I can bring in uh, government um, and also some industry uh, folks to come in. Some, and then also, of course, all of the military as well as international. So I have a, a very broad, diverse student body and um, customer base. So my entire base is global as well as national for the kinds of students that we bring in. So what we focus on is, is STEM. Uh, I have a strategy department that really looks at how science and technology affect strategy and vice versa. And, we, and then we, we do the gamut of teaching, of quantum, of, of, of cyber, and double E, and all of the things that you would think of in the, in the STEM world. And we do it with, with the students who come, military, civilian, US, and international, coming as a team to look at problems and, 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 and how to solve them. So I'm a graduate institution, but a naval command. And this makes it a very unique place for the globe, in, in fact. So my student body does a lot of work together, and they are unique. For many in industry, they're kind of a consultant. So industry is very much knocking on our doors to, to be partners with us also. So we're on, a, on all kinds of new ways of looking at the world and at the globe and at war fighting and at peacemaking also but also at collaboration and how you do this in, in that world. So we can help with that narrative that was being discussed in that last panel, that these are people who are going to go and lead their countries. And I've got uh, students from that, that range the globe and of, and, of course, within the US. So the impact is intended to be war fighting prowess warfighting integration, knowledge integration, and exploration integration, and the ability to have those kinds of, of, of activities focused on warfighting, but also focused on all of government kinds of issues. That's, that's what we do. That's who I am, and that's the um, privilege of service that, that I have. Sir, back to you. Sir Simon. Well, well uh, uh, and Charlie, thank you very much, and it's a, a real pleasure uh, to be here uh, and a fascinating topic. Um, 
I think the reason why I'm on this panel is, is particularly because of my last role in government. I'm no longer in government. I left the post uh, about a year ago. And like Anne, I might just say a very brief word about uh, the Joint Intelligence Committee in the United Kingdom, uh, because there isn't an exact equivalent uh, in the United States uh, or anywhere else that I've yet discovered. So the Joint Intelligence uh, Committee uh, is the place where both intelligence agencies uh, and uh, key government departments come together to consider uh, analysis of the UK's national security challenges and interests. Uh, it's backed by a, a body of analysts who I led for four and a half years, drawn from all sorts of different uh, places, including uh, from time to time the private sector. Uh, and our job was to create uh, those uh, assessments of foreign policy issues, uh, whether it was, for example, about the state of Iran's nuclear program, about China's intentions on Taiwan, uh, about Russia's plans for the invasion of Ukraine before February 2022. Will they? Won't they? Uh, and I was in the fortunate position of knowing absolutely the answers to all of those questions and everything else that might uh, be of interest to British security. Um, so we would uh, 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 report to the National Security Council and to our Prime Minister. I would um, typically uh, have an opportunity at National Security Council meetings to set the scene uh, on a very wide uh, range of issues. So I think that's what brings me to this panel. I'm not an intelligence officer, but I've worked in intelligence and particularly uh, in intelligence assessment and all source uh, assessment. So that's what I think I bring to this uh, party. I think where I start off when we're thinking about intelligence uh, sharing uh, in an AUKUS context uh, is that uh, intelligence, our countries spend a vast quantity of money on uh, gaining intelligence insights into the world around us. And that uh, intelligence is then too valuable to sort of put into a picture gallery and just admire it from time to time. Intelligence is only of use if you can use it, uh, otherwise there's very little point in gathering it. So you have to have a system of uh, intelligence exploitation which allows you to inject your intelligence insights, sometimes your intelligence actions, uh, into uh, better policy, policy successes, uh, achievements for your country and your partners. Uh, and in the UK, of course, uh, one of the bedrocks of this uh, is our partnership within the Five Eyes uh, Alliance, uh, which, uh, of course, faces its own challenges from time to time, but which I would say is probably the gold standard for uh, intelligence sharing uh, amongst uh, very close partners. When asked about this, I sometimes reflect that when you're trying to build confidence in partnerships uh, like Five Eyes, the first 50 years are the hardest. After that, it probably gets a little bit easier, but uh, uh, we, we've got to a, a pretty good place on this. But the point that I wanted to draw from that is that uh, perhaps 15, 20 years ago, intelligence sharing beyond your close family of intelligence partners looked a little bit less, a little more optional, shall we say, a little bit um, less critical. But of course, what has happened is that we've now found ourselves in a world in which we and our close partners are facing some extremely capable actors who use exceptionally uh, malign uh, means from time to time of advancing their interests in competition with us. So if we can't share the intelligence that we have on those activities, uh, how do we bring other countries who are a little further away from our, uh, our sort of Five Eyes heartland, how do we bring them into the information picture uh, that we have? How do we help them to be able to spot uh, what some of our adversaries are doing, what some of their motivations are, what some of their means of achieving uh, advantage uh, are, whether that's uh, Russia, for example, in the Sahel, uh, and uh, the extraordinary uh, lack of interest they show in anything uh, close to human rights uh, uh, standards uh, there, or whether it's uh, China's pursuit of uh, military bases uh, in 
uh, the Pacific Islands, for example, security agreements with the Solomon Islands and so forth. So we need to be better at sharing our intelligence insight with a non-traditional range of partners if we're to maximise our use of this extraordinarily expensive investment that we've made. As Jim on the previous panel pointed out, that isn't always easy, even within Five Eyes. You know, there is a mass of material which in the United States carries a no-form sticker on it and makes it hard to share. All of our systems have similar uh, challenges, sometimes even sharing from agency to agency, let alone uh, from country to country. So the task in my mind is how do we take agencies uh, whose very ethos is around protecting uh, secrets uh, and get them uh, to uh, just open the aperture uh, a bit and be able to share some of those insights uh, with non-traditional partners in ways which are not cavalier, which do not put our capabilities or uh, still less our, our human sources uh, at risk, uh, but nevertheless allow us uh, to share that experience. So that's one of the things which is close to my heart. I'd be delighted as the conversation moves on to talk about what some of the obstacles are, some of the ways in which we can approach uh, that challenge to make it more feasible. But I will pause there. May I add just a couple of things here? So one of the bridges that Simon and I would be crossing here. Is that he talks about intelligence, and we all know what, what that is. And I would put a, a, a moniker on that, that I'm also talking about intelligence or intelligent people working those things. So the conversations that can go on when you're learning something, uh, when we're in a quantum discussion or when we are in a space science discussion, and you have a different point of view that does come in, you begin to share your knowledge. And that starts the journey towards saying, if you're competent and confident, and you can then share this, and your transparency of knowledge transfer is happening, then you can begin to build a partnership that then might get you to a higher place. But you can't start from, this does not start from just ground zero and say, trust me today. There's a constant conversation so that there, this is a human factor in what AUKUS is at some fundamental level, just as intelligence and trusting your sources is a human factor. We cannot forget that workforce development and the employment of knowledge and the application of knowledge starts that, that journey that then gets to Simon's point with, with regard to then trusting at a deeper level the, the person with whom you are doing that learning. And I, I completely uh, agree with it. You know, trying to get to that point of trust uh, with new partners is critical, and you're absolutely right. The human factor uh, is central to that. And, and there's a, um, a saying uh, in the United Kingdom, I don't know whether, whether you use it in the, in the uh, United States, which says you can't fatten a pig on market day. Uh, in other words, you know, you can't just leap, as Anne says, on day one and expect the person opposite the table to, to trust you. You have to build that. So one of the things which goes into that uh, trust, whether it's within a context like AUKUS or uh, uh, beyond that, uh, is the question of fidelity. Do the people that you're talking to believe that you are telling them things right. which are a real truth? Or do they suspect that you are simply trying to influence them? Uh, so that is a, another challenge in terms of intelligence sharing. You need to build up a track record of trust. Do you even know what, what truth is? And you don't know it if you can't master the science and can't master the, the technology. Do you even know it? I think it was uh, uh, Ian, I'm not quite sure, who talked about the arms race, the space race, and the technology race. I would add a fourth race, and it is the cognitive race. And that race really matters because it underlines all those other ones. So this is where the, the bridging here between intelligence, effectiveness, and trust, and dependability, reliability, all those things, starts off with, do you know what you're talking about? Um, I'd like to, you've teed up a lot of things uh, in your opening comments, and I want to make sure that we kind of zip back and forth uh, between the theoretical yeah. uh, enablers, uh, the institutional uh, drivers, and then some of the more specific, I think, and pointy uh, questions that we have. Um, Simon, uh, I'll take you up on your offer uh, to begin talking about some of the obstacles that we face, uh, particularly when we're talking about um, the requirements 
that our systems, you can be more singular than you want, and you can say your system uh, requires to put that collaboration in. Again, uh, feel free to kind of zoom between kind of abstract theoretical and then more concrete here. Well, I'd be glad to do that. And, and uh, I think where I would start from uh, is that although we have always uh, sought to share uh, intelligence uh, sensibly, and of course some of our agencies do it uh, agency to agency on specific issues, sometimes operational matters, sometimes uh, wider than that, I think our experience over Ukraine uh, was a real sea change uh, for many of us in the United Kingdom. Uh, my organization in the two months before the Russian uh, invasion uh, shared more um, uh, assessment with some very, very non-traditional partners uh, inside two months than it had done in any previous year. We suddenly had that compulsion that we needed to share the story of what we saw Russia doing and what we thought was going to happen next. And in order to do that, you can't just go to another government. This is Anne's point about trust. You can't just go to them and say, we're coming here to tell you that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. How far does that get you? You've got to have enough um, uh, data and information behind that, uh, some of which will, uh, of course, not be in the public domain, but some of it may be. I mean, we were getting very good um, public sector um, uh, overhead of... Uh, Russian troop movements uh, at that stage. How do you package that into something which you can um, uh, sell to uh, your partners? So I think that was, um, uh, for us, a demonstration of what could be done. Uh, and I would also add to that, and this is another really interesting topic, at least for people like me, I hope that some, some of you, was the way in which some intelligence was used in the public domain as, you know, labelled as intelligence, uh, in a way which had been extremely rare uh, before that. And the process by which that was done by the US in particular, but the UK uh, as well, uh, I think is a very interesting uh, exercise. So what are some of the obstacles and how do you overcome them? Well, I've talked about one of them, which is uh, a, a cultural obstacle, but it's not just cultural, it's a real obstacle, which is uh, intelligence is often gained by use of uh, technologies, capabilities, uh, sources, which you simply cannot afford to reveal uh, to an intelligent uh, adversary. Uh, and therefore, you need to be really careful that in putting uh, information out to partners, uh, you do so in a way which is risk mitigated, uh, both in relation to the specific partner, how secure do you think they are, do you understand their processes well enough, who are they going to share that intelligence with uh, within their system. So it's risk mitigated in relation to them, but it's also risk mitigated in terms of the content. And what I mean by that is that our adversaries are very adept at building jigsaw puzzles. You know, you may give one bit of intelligence over there, another bit of intelligence over there. You can be sure that in uh, uh, you know, Moscow or Beijing, there are people who are trying to stick those pieces together and work out where are your intelligence accesses, where are your intelligence gaps. And so you have to be very careful about the totality of what you're uh, 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 talking about. So having really strong risk mitigation uh, is important. Um. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'll just do, do two more things please, very quickly. Uh, second, uh, second thing, you need a really strong leadership drive to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be a very strongly uh, expressed view, uh, very often from a political level, that this is something which has to be seen as mission critical uh, to intelligence agencies and not just something which they do in their spare time. And to be fair to our agencies, I don't think they need much encouragement, but they sometimes need help in driving it down within their systems. Uh, because very often, in my world, intelligence analysts, they don't see it. That's not why they joined up necessarily, was to share reduced classification versions of their work, you know, sort of dumbing down great masterpieces of art. Uh, you know, we don't want to paint by numbers. That's not what we joined for. But persuading them that this is a mission in its own right is uh, extremely important. Uh, and then thirdly, and then I, I, I will stop, what that leads you to is a, a sort of cultural change uh, amongst some of your uh, analysts. Uh, I think that we often come to sharing uh, intelligence too late in the process. In other words, what happens mm -hmm. is that you do an intelligence assessment of an issue, 
uh, you then get somebody with a big black sharpie to run through uh, various sentences, and you're left with a sort of patchwork of sentences which tell you something, but aren't always as persuasive as they could be if you'd actually started by writing for release, uh, in which case you can build a true, uh, it's got to be fidelity within it, but you can build a true picture uh, which is perhaps more informative to your partners without revealing more, more secrets that you don't want to. May I, may I um, riff off of one thing that uh, Simon said in his first issue about culture. So there's lots of issues here about culture that can be explored. But when I took over at NPS, the 10th Fleet commander called me. Well, he, yeah, he, he called me. And he is a three-star who is a cyber commander, one of my clients. And we have two cyber centers. We're known for how we work on cyber. So he said, Ian, I'd like to make two of my information warfare officers a master's and a PhD in cultural anthropology. Mm. So I said, I can't do that, but I can find a partner who can, and then we can bring together the, the cyber expertise that I have and that. But what are you thinking about? And he said, look, at some level, cyber starts with ones and zeros in basic math. At the next level, it's all the algorithms. At the next level, it is analytics. At the next level, it is language, and then meaning, and then culture. And I am blind, this, get, get, this gets back to the barriers, I am blind with any of our adversaries on how they see numbers through their culture. It's an interesting thing about culture and math, go figure. But, but this, is, this is where, this is a really complex time. And being able to understand things rapidly and in this swirl of all these things does require cultural, mathematical, technological, scientific, language, and all of that into one thing to understand what is, what is going on. And that's what Simon, I think, is implying, yeah. is that this is complex. And, it, and it's gradual, and it's at times intermediary. At times, it's, it seems like it's not enough. But you've got to press constantly to know more, but know it well. I can uh, pick up on this, because we're talking about building the trust, making sure that we have cultural competence, and mm -hmm. how we look at these. Uh, I kind of, in some ways, want to fast forward the conversation to the output, uh, not just in Intel collaboration, but if we're talking about AUKUS, uh, some of the projects, some of the new initiatives, some of the critical and emerging technologies that we hope to build together. And uh, I'm hoping, Admiral, maybe you can start us off here to think a little bit about how do we wrap our heads around what increased collaboration, both in the Intel specter and on the people side of things, which you've started talking about, what do we hope that it actually yields? What's the point of doing this other than simply forming a, a better common operating picture uh, between all these partners? You don't want to yield easiness. You don't want to yield easy answers to make it clearer or more clarifying. Um, you need to, t to understand, I think, the pieces of that. I think that the output, that's a great question. I, I think the output is about common one, you got to understand if you're in a common purpose. Do you have the same value systems and belief about the dignity of the individual versus the importance and the order of, of the state? Once you come to that point, and it's not, it's not a minor point, but it can be an agreeable point. And then you, then you come together and understand that the output is about a critical environment where you can competently have an exchange of ideas in platforms and convening places that give you that, and that you're solving problems as a very diverse group toward a common purpose. We don't have that. Organizationally, you heard about this a little bit, but we, we are still stovepiping things. And stovepiping just does not work anymore. It is a, it's, it's, a, it's a method toward disaster. It can be good for developing some specific expertise, but for problem solving, you gotta get out of the stovepipe. We are in, we talk about uh, alliances and, and uh, agreements, but, we, but the hard work of that needs to go down very deeply. So I think it's about building a critical uh, uh, knowledge 
culture, I guess, is, is, what I, is what I would say, because every problem does not have an answer or a solution, but every day has a new problem. So how do you go about trying to fix those things? Because a problem can become very um, dramatic over time if you don't get to that. So I think a critical culture where you, you bring in everybody that, that matters, who's competent, who, who's helpful, to, to solving those problems. I think that's, that's the outcome you want. A specific outcome I don't have, but the general uh, approach to problems, I think, is, is probably what I would say. Yeah. Um, Simon, when we think about this AUKUS as reshaping collaboration, but also intelligence cooperation, how do you see that being put into effect in the Indo-Pacific specifically? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think you're right. Um, so one uh, rather obvious uh, consequence that I've seen flowing from AUKUS uh, is that the United Kingdom um, has not, for quite a long time, had a particularly strong intelligence view of the Pacific. Mm. Uh, it's not been a, a core area for us compared with Russia or, or core China or some other parts of the world, Middle East, for example, where the UK has very strong um, uh, uh, interests. But I think that AUKUS is beginning to reshape uh, priorities. Uh, I think it's also, and, and there's a bit of chicken and egg here, you know, is this because of AUKUS or, or is this because of the recognition of, of China as an adversary? Uh, we've seen far greater investment uh, in intelligence in relation to China, whether it's China itself or China's activities uh, within the region uh, or beyond. Uh, because all of our countries have recognized uh, the various threats that can emanate from uh, China. I mean, you know, we all understand that in some areas it's comp competition, in some areas China is an adversary, but you know, there are a lot of areas uh, where we are having to redirect uh, intelligence uh, resource to deal with uh, some of the implications uh, of that. I think there's also been uh, a greater interest in... Uh, what I would describe as intelligence diplomacy, which is the use of intelligence uh, to try to inform uh, the views of interested uh, countries in, in matters which should be of concern to them. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, talking about the ways in which China seeks influence uh, in Pacific islands, or, or, or for that matter, in Africa or elsewhere, is very important, but in order to be able to do that convincingly, you actually have to put some specifics onto the table. You can't just wring your hands and say, you know, if you do with China, deal with China, you have to be very careful about corruption of your officials and your political system. You actually have to uh, produce something which is persuasive to people uh, and shows examples of, of where and how that has happened. So these are all, I think, uh, uh, ways in which, um, whether it's AUKUS, or whether it's the concern about China on which AUKUS, uh, frankly, is built, uh, you know, the, which of those it is, uh, it, it is giving uh, an added intelligence uh, focus, I think, to our countries. So when I was doing some homework on this, on, on AUKUS, I came across an article of 1921 of, of, of by Arzan uh, Terapur on East Asia Forum. And it gets back to something that Simon said and, and implied. But he used a couple of phrases that I thought were kind of interesting. Radical technological integration. And the, the notion that the mutual trust and habits of cooperation. He used those, those phrases. But what that leads to is a new security environment. If you think about that, where the environment for security it has a different definition of intelligence to a certain point. It's, it's about technology. It's about sensors. It's about what you know versus what you don't know at times, or what you don't know thinking about what you, you do know. So this whole security architecture begins to change because AUKUS is setting up this radical technological integration that also does require radical intelligence uh, integration and those kind of things. So there's something new going on here uh, that Simon certainly implies and that I, we talk about at NPS. What's, what's going on new here? How does quantum change things? 
How do you know things? How do you know what's, what's there in front of you? How do you optimize what's in front of you? So this is a, these are some great questions that the intelligence um, um, core and, uh, asks all of, of the time, and that part of my job is to help to answer. I, I very much agree with that. Uh, I think um, when we talk about the, the risk of stovepiping, you can't actually stovepipe intelligence and say that is intelligence. It, it, it has to flow all the way through uh, technology, geopolitics, intelligence, and, and that increasingly, I think, is the outlook of our best agencies, is that it's that ability to fuse, bo fuse both uh, technologies, uh, different viewpoints, uh, different ways of doing things, uh, which actually makes them most effective. That's right. General, uh, curious, as the head of uh, not a JPME, but a PME, yeah, a PME. institution, as you said, uh, that draws from a large uh, and broad-based and diverse student uh, body from multiple countries, from multiple sectors. Um, when we talk about AUKUS, how has this informed new efforts at capacity building? I'm thinking about people capacity building at uh, the college. First of all, the Navy has had, the U.S. Navy has had a long association, and the, and the government, the military, with Australia. I mean, it goes back many years. So there is a, there's a basis there for conversation that goes on. We have many students from Australia and other places uh, who come together and talk about things. Um, I think that along, so let me go back. What was the, the end of the question? Uh, the question is, how has, we talked about how a second ago. Yeah how AUKUS has reshaped some of the UK's intelligence efforts and how it thinks about them yeah. regionally, kind of what it brings right, to the right. table. I'm curious from an educational uh, standpoint, <clears throat> how this has changed, how you approach yeah. the mission. So, so, so other people also have, have an interest, and we've heard that. So the uh, Singaporeans, Japanese, the Taiwanese, they all have an interest, but they're thinking differently about what these kinds of arrangements look like. So it's interesting, when I go to ASEAN, or NATO Defense College um, events, many times ASEAN is at NATO and NATO is at ASEAN events. It's really very interesting when I go to those kind of events. So there is a, a, a dialogue opening up. And so within us and what N NPS is doing with Aussies or others is that as we can, depending upon the Five Eyes issues or other kinds of arrangements, we are doing uh, experimentation, we're doing undersea sensor work, uh, we're doing space, lots of space science work uh, with, with allies, in, including Five Eyes and others. But there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an opening up, and with the Australians, you have a long line of history of working together, both in war and in peace. So. There is a, there's a trust piece there that, that comes into all that. So there are people who are looking at that, and some are wanting to, to come into the, to that d dialogue. Some are, are saying, I don't want to be in that, but I want to know more about it because they have become now an adversary or a competitor. So, so I, I just think that this, this, this whole government view by the Australians, this is not just about weapons, this is about science and technology and workforce development and bringing in a lot of people and housing, I mean, it just goes on. There is a tremendous national effort required by the Australians and a commitment over time and some sustainment over time. We've been through a bit of this on our own, but we want to be alongside to help that along. So I think the tightness of nation to nation, to nation where trade, commerce, all those things, come into play. This is a national, international um, foray that we've never seen before. And so it is a prototype, not the lasting egg, egg example. It's a prototype for 21st century way of looking at uh, alliances and partnerships are flexible and yet steady. Does that make, does that make any sense? Yeah. So I think it's about the larger architecture again. What is happening here are two nations, three, um, who have this ability to say, here is what an alliance can look like, and it's flexible, it's, we, you know, we come and go, we, we, the rules are a little bit different, but let's go in and have a 21st century alliance structure which is as flexible and dynamic as the world is, and that's hard.
So I think that that's what this is, is that there's a strategic piece here that we can't miss. And the narrative on this is important. And if we, so one of the narratives is, this is about nuclear stuff. It's about nuclear propulsion and energy in support of your war fighting capability. It need not then ice out your belief and your behavior toward nuclear non-proliferation. That's a weapons issue. Okay. So understanding that there are differences here that really can bring you together. So nuclear energy, that is actually a source of, of decarbonization. I mean, let, let's continue the conversation. So what do you, how, how are you looking at these things as national strengths? So we need to understand the dialogue and parse out the arguments that don't matter, that are put in front of you. It's kind of like a lawsuit is intended to deflect on, on maybe the main thing, right? Don't let those issues distract from the, the way the world is changing on governance, on structures, on alliances, on knowledge, and how do you understand that? So I would submit to you that many of our Cold War organizations don't help that along. And so if you're talking about inclusivity versus exclusivity, and you need to have certain things required of you to do that, it's a different world. And we're organized still in a Cold War environment, and we need to understand the 21st century organization, knowledge, acquisition. How do you, how do you manage information? It gets back to Simon's issue. These things are all wrapped up in a strategically new environment. Yeah. I want to build on that. Uh, Simon, you know, you talked earlier <clears throat> about how Ukraine began to teach some lessons about how we get information, sometimes classified, sometimes unclassified, to more partners so that they understand what's going on, can take appropriate action as we see fit. Uh, but the rubber hits the road here, and it becomes more challenging, I think, when we talk not only simply about the dissemination of information, but asking other non-traditional allies and partners to input into our systems, particularly when we talk about the collaborative endeavors, be it on AI, be it on cyber, be it on quantum, be it on unmanned undersea vehicles. So uh, one of the questions, this is where I said I wanted us to be theoretical and then get a little bit more practical, is AUKUS Pillar 2, mm -hmm. so the not submarines part of this, has been a conversation that's evolved over the last several months, several a year or so, about whether or not we're willing to broaden the tent mm. further. And, um, and you mentioned uh, the Singaporeans. This is, I think, much more pointed when we get to the Japanese and yeah. the South Koreans, right. particularly when we're looking at the region, have vast amounts to contribute but their systems and their information controls are in very different places than the three countries that are involved with AUKUS. So uh, I'd love to have your thoughts, uh, controversial or not, uh, because this is a live issue about what needs to be done to pull in really important players such as Japan and South Korea what are the enablers? You had talked about some of the cultural issues, some of the leadership issues, but some of the con, you know, information controls to pull them in. And then what's the value of having them in, particularly when we talk about aspects of uh, Pillar 2? Well, uh, let, let me start, and I'm sure Anne will, will have some uh, great comments uh, to follow. Uh, it, it would be really easy for us to sit here and say, of course we must bring in Japan, of course we must bring in uh, South Korea, of course we must bring in all of these people in, in terms of building a partnership and a community of intent, you know, what's not to like, and we can all hold hands and, and skip into the sunset and, you know, like... Because that's what national security professionals do. Because uh, folk, folk like me, exactly. Um, you know, but, but we can't... We can't do that. You know, we have to take this uh, seriously. And yeah. uh, some of the obstacles, uh, many of the obstacles, which stand in the way of good collaboration with uh, 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 the next circle outwards of uh, partners, are there for very sound reasons. Uh, and you know, even if we think of our own 
histories, um, uh, recent histories. You know, if you look at um, what appears to be Russian penetration of the German BND, for example, there's a court case going on in Germany at the moment. Uh, if you think of the effect of the Snowden um, revelations, if you think of um, uh, you know, the recent story of, a, of a, uh, an aide to the governor of uh, New York uh, uh, as a Chinese agent, you know, these are real things. Um, we have adversaries who are constantly and relentlessly and at massive scale uh, trying to penetrate our secrets. So we can't simply pretend that all we have to do is fire off uh, a load of confidential information and uh, you know, we're confident that somebody at the other end will treat it properly. We need to have proper controls. We need proper risk management. The trick, and this is really difficult, Charlie, as you know, and, and as Anne, I'm sure, has, has, has lived uh, as well, is that one person's risk management is another person's blockage. Right. Uh, and trying to navigate those things requires both strong leadership and confidence uh, and a really structured approach to risk management so that you can explain to your own people, apart from anything else, why you are prepared to share this amount of information and what you expect to derive from it in terms of collective benefit uh, rather than simply instructing people to release information which they really don't want to do. We have to take people with us on, on this, which is why a cultural change is needed. But it also requires us to have very frank conversations, which do happen uh, with some of those partners who we would like to bring closer in. And we have to say to them, look, um, guys, we're just not that confident in your information management system. Now show us how you are going to handle uh, these challenges. You know, we can't just dance around this. This has to be a very explicit and structured conversation with those countries uh, who we want to bring in. But the returns, if we can get there, are potentially tremendous, both in terms of the capability which uh, advanced countries uh, can bring, but also in terms of the geostrategic web which we build around AUKUS and around uh, our perception of, of our strategic adversaries. Uh, which will make us much stronger if we can achieve that. So the web is a good idea, is, is a great word, and national security um, strategy of the U.S. We heard earlier uses the word lattice. Uh, that is not a linear uh, model. It's a very non-linear in many ways. So I think that there is this, the intelligence piece needs to be protected carefully because there are lives at stake. And there is, at, and at times, existential uh, issues at stake. You need to take it seriously. So while I appreciate that there's you know, hand-waving, let's all get along, the intelligence experts have to make some hard calls at times. But there's a vast amount of knowledge that can be attained through doing things together in a, in a teamed and um, uh, coordinated way. Let's take. One of the things that we're working on is AI wargaming. Hmm. Hmm. You, uh, you could do a natural disaster war game with AI in, involved in that. Nothing is, is, uh, is of any kind of a level of classification or anything else. You can do lots of, of work on war gaming and then put AI into it and understand now how AI is changing the, the, the tactics, the techniques, <coughs> the, the, the um, moves, the maneuver, the, and who all is involved with, with that. For instance, again, AI in wargaming. I don't know if all of you know, but if, if you have <clears throat> um, commercial ships, and I remember I, I was the deputy, the deputy commander at Transcom when we began the work in Afghanistan. So if you are a shipping company, and this is a great wargaming question, uh, and, you, and you are now asked to load lo lo logistics and take them into a war, a war theater, what is your insurance company going to say? Your insurance company could be the, the, the issue that, that stops you from movement. That's a war gaming question, and then you start putting some AI in it. You, you begin to learn things without ever going into a classified fight environment. What do you learn? Is all the common open stuff is out there. And the aggregation of that in the open world is to say, okay, now I, un I understand this. 
So I think that there's a lot to be said about intelligence, but there are some really high risk things in here. There's a lower risk in understanding the effects of things, and you can sh share that and have a lot of fun with it, but gain deep knowledge as to how to make it work. Okay. I completely agree with that. I mean, intelligence is often confirmatory rather than revelatory. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it confirms things which you thought you already knew, right. in which case you don't necessarily need to put that on the table to be able to tell the story you want, you want to tell. Let me um, go out uh, to the audience. I have a lot more questions, but I'd like to pause and just see if people have questions. I'm not sure if we have a microphone. Yes, no. You're going to use your big projecting voice, uh, and you're going to identify yourself. No. Please. Don't worry, I have that. I'm Robin Walker with Air Force Futures. Right. Um, I really like you started with Teddy Roosevelt at my... I like that you started with Teddy Roosevelt, Ambassador, uh, uh, Admiral. At my graduation from NPS, we talked about the Great White Fleet or at our uh, graduation commencement address. And we talked about intelligence diplomacy as a recovering intelligence analyst. I've done my share of that. Uh, unfortunately, even at Five Eyes conferences, it was kind of dumbing it down to the being shared level, um, which is really a tragedy because you have to share that and most of the most of the SIG and most of the other good stuff is by default shared across the Five Eyes level, and so we need to continue to do that. Uh, you talked about building trust, and I think that's a really, really important aspect of it. Um, I think when you talk about some of this intelligence diplomacy, when you talk about building trust, most of what we've talked about is, is one way, and I think we need to think about this in as a two-way street, right? Um, there's us trusting other countries with our exquisite information as kind of the big paternalistic global power here. Let me come down from on high and share the great wisdom that I have with my intelligence apparatus with you, and you should be very grateful that I am trusting you with this information that I have gleaned. Um, and that is pretty paternalistic and it's it's showing a little bit of trust, but it's not showing that two-way street on trust. So uh, within the Air Force, we talk about a concept we called um, being integrated by design, which is not showing up on and being able to, on day one of a fight and saying, hey, we're gonna fight together, this isn't this great. You have to build that habit of cooperation as Arzan talked about, um, from the very beginning, from the ideas of how you are going to fight, how you're going to share that information. And if you go into a country like Japan, like the Philippines, uh, like Singapore, whatever, they're going to have some unique insights in those Absolutely. countries from being in the region. Like you talk to Japan, their threat perception is just as valid as our perception of what their threat perception should be. So you demonstrate trust by asking for trust and not doing it in a paternalistic, one-directional kind of way here. Uh, and I think that needs to be built into all of our efforts in intelligence diplomacy um, and not just saying, hey, we can share the dumbed-down version and that's good enough for you global countries from us on high as the global superpower here. I was not implying that at all, but Simon, that's up to you. Uh, no, no, look, I'm, I completely agree. I mean, we've talked about our <laughs> part of it, which is the transmission part, but, but I completely yeah. agree with you, Robert, that, that it, it needs to be a partnership, and that's what Anne yeah, and I yeah. were talking yeah. about around trust, as, as, as you recognise. So I, uh, I completely agree with that, and part of the context for that, which I think is also important for us to recognise in a geopolitical world, uh, is that actually there is a very, very large slice of the world that doesn't automatically see us as the good guys anymore. That's right. Uh, you know, we are, have to, we are having to, to walk through doors where the reception we get is not going to be, thank goodness you've come uh, to help us. Um, you, you know, so that makes that building of trust and uh, building that on professionalism and expertise and mutual professional respect uh, extremely difficult, uh, extremely important, and Anne's point about cultural anthropology actually runs right into that. If you don't understand uh, or try to understand the way in which your your potential partners think about problems, you are going to misfire. Sure. And I've, you know, I sh I'm sure we've all got stories to tell of uh, misjudgments of tonality or culture, yeah. which can lead to things bombing very quickly. So I mean, m bombing metaphorically, not literally, I hope. Uh, <laughs> although maybe that too, I don't know. Um, you know, w w we have to be very careful. So I, I completely agree with your comment. Yeah. Let me uh, go out uh, and just kind of noting the time, I'm gonna take maybe two questions at once. One and then over to here. Thanks, uh, Jennifer Maroney from RAND. Um, just a, a quick, comment in and around risk and stovepipes, which have been brought up here a lot today. Some of the work that we've been doing at RAND is looking at ways in which we can improve our information sharing, but 
Some of it comes down to the perception of risk, which is very different in the intelligence community <coughs> versus the operations community versus the acquisition community and the policy community. And you know, we've sort of found that those communities are just not on the same page in terms of how they understand risks to sharing information. And the other quick observation I'll make is sort of internally, we, we really do have to get those communities to talk better to one another. For example, if the operations community would like to share a bit of information with an ally to support a, a training event or an exercise, having the wherewithal to have a really good justification for why that's important that helps to reflect their understanding of the intelligence community's perception of risk, we don't do that very well. Um, it's, you know, the justification is, well, we need to do this, we need to share this information, or we're gonna lose the war, or we're gonna not be prepared. But, you know, there, there, there's definitely ways in order to improve our internal communications to break down some of those stovepipes if we start to get on the same page as regards risk. Thanks. And sir? <clears throat> uh, Roy Gutman of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. Um, you mentioned Ukraine. Um, I, I wonder if you could just give a, a brief gloss on how P Putin's intelligence apparatus uh, seems to have failed so completely on the eve of the <clears throat> of the invasion. Uh, how did they get things so wrong? Are there lessons for Western intelligence? And were there any distress calls from within the uh, Russian intelligence apparatus about the coming disaster? Well, shall I try and answer the second one first? Or yeah. Leave the first yeah, yeah. one to, to, to Anne, and I'll, I'll have to do it very briefly, but I'll be very happy to talk to you um, uh, outside. Look, uh, one point to make. Uh, any intelligence apparatus, no matter how good it is, uh, is only hours away from a potential intelligence failure. I mean, that's the nature of intelligence. It is difficult. I mean, look at, look at Israel and, and Gaza. Yeah. Uh, but there are things you can do within your system to make intelligence failure less likely uh, than it would otherwise have been. If you build, as you do in Russia, uh, a system which is absolutely self-referential, which does not like passing bad news up the chain uh, to the boss, mm -hmm. Uh, a system which habitually lies to itself and knows that it's doing it, uh, you are much more likely to have an intelligence failure. Uh, and that was part of what happened in this case, of course, was that uh, folk knew what the boss wanted to do and therefore intelligence was manipulated uh, and funneled in a way which told a story. Yeah, very, very quickly. Um, so we heard um, from Scoble on yesterday about how difficult it is to forecast. The intelligence to forecast is different than operational intelligence, which is giving you things right on the ground right now that, you, that you're able to work on. That also does the risk thing. So if, if you're trying to forecast, that's a hard game, and there's more art than there is skill at times. When it comes down to operational intelligence, that's a, that is, you, you can work with that and have almost immediate impact. It really does depend. Again, risk there is going to be different. And I agree that there's a risk. Uh, equity there, but you gotta make those and say which one's a higher, a higher priority. At times, you won't do things operationally so you don't give away the forecasted kind of thing. There's all kinds of complexity here. But I think that um, it's an, the operational side of Ukraine has been very, very useful for understanding intelligence differently than the forecasting side. Just perhaps on the uh, very, very briefly, because I know we're running out of time, but on the, on the risk perception point, I agree with you, and it's, it's not a surprise really, because the professional backgrounds are just so different in, in many respects. And, and with intelligence agencies, there isn't always the porosity with other parts of the system, which leads to sort of cultural uh, diversity. I feel I'm, I'm almost standing on a soapbox here, but uh, you know what I mean? So um, the risks are different. Uh, but so is the uh, professional mindset which uh, people build up. I've got to say one, one more thing very, very quick. The unexpected in all of these things. So AUKUS is an unexpected conversation as to how people learn. So the Aussies have a different kind of testing and, and evaluation for entering the, 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 the Royal Australian Navy than does the US. There's a conversation going on amongst educators. What is the best way to prepare people to get into the, uh, to this kind of work? And it's a great, a great dialogue. 
Oh. Uh, so I know that we're at time, but I uh, want to thank and have all of you join me in thanking our panelists for um, covering the waterline. We've gone from education to Teddy Roosevelt to Five Eyes to Ukraine, and the only question that we didn't answer were which phone calls did you get from inside the Kremlin, which I'm sure if we had had just two more minutes, you would have told us <laughs> everything on. If everyone can join me in thanking our panelists for a really robust conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.